Thank you all very much for coming to this session on Howard Rafa. I'm actually filming this on election day in the morning. So we all have a bit of jitters, and I know Howard and Estelle would as well. I'm going to talk about Howard's uh, activities leading up to and during his first founding directorship of YASA, the International Institute of for Applied Systems Analysis. So to start off, let me take you back to the 60s and the 70s. Those were pretty grim times. You see on the lower right here the Berlin Wall. If you've been to Berlin recently, you see this. It looks a lot better now. On the upper left, the nuclear warheads and weapons and missiles, of which we had 5,000 then. Fortunately, they're down now to 1,500, but we still have quite a few. And on the lower left, you see the, um, the gas crisis in the early 70s. During this period, a premier Kossigian of the Soviet Union, of the then Soviet Union, and uh, Johnson met in a small town called Glassboro, halfway between New York, where the UN building was, and still is, which uh, Kossigian visited at the time, and Washington, uh, the seat of the White House. And I think they chose this as a neutral place to do some discussions. You also see there on the picture on the left, Ted Sorensen, and right, right behind uh, Kosygin, you see uh, McNabara. So the idea of this meeting was to talk about things that during the Cold War and the large antagony between the United States and the Soviet Union, what the two states could do together in some modest way. And out of this idea came the notion that we might want to start an international institute where people from the East and the West could meet and do productive research on industrialized societies. So the signing of the YASA Charter, which evolved from that meeting, was done in London in 1972. You can see a few figures here on the left is uh, Philip Handler, then National Academy President of the United States. In the middle two are on the left, uh, Solly Suckerman, the, uh, the, the, the head of the Royal Society at the time, and to the right, a very important person of YASA, uh, German Grisiani, uh, who I will talk to you a little bit later as well. And they signed the charter. One of the elements of the charter was to select a small town south of Vienna called Luxembourg, not to be confused with Luxembourg, L.A. Axenberg uh, as a site for Yasa. Here's a map. Vienna is in the center and the, at the bottom. About, about 20 kilometers south of Vienna is Luxembourg. Howard Rafer had been very instrumental in the process of developing Yasa and the ideas for Yasa. And he was appointed as the first director. Uh, you see him here on the left signing the Yasa Austria Agreement to house Yasa in Vienna, or near Vienna, in Luxembourg. And to the right of him is, again, German Grisiani. And you see them again also in the next picture, uh, where they shake hands after they're signing the agreement to house Yasa in Austria. Uh, German Grisiani, uh, parenthetically, was the son-in-law of Kosygin. So there are some aspects of this history that are quite interesting as well. The 12 charter members of YASA in these very early days were coming from primarily the East and the West. Of course, the Soviet Union and the United States were the largest member with the largest contribution to YASA, represented by their respective Academy of Sciences. And then the Eastern Bloc, including Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, and others, uh, East Germany, West East Germany, were also parts of YASA, and then the Western countries were represented by the Western Europe, European countries, West Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, and also added were Canada and the United States, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and Japan. Now YASA, one of the attractive points of the Austrian proposal to have YASA housed in Vienna, in Luxembourg, was that they wanted to refurbish a castle, a beautiful castle that Maria Theresa built in the mid-18th century. You see it here on the left. It's located in a park, the Luxembourg Park. And this castle has housed Yasa since 1972. But it didn't always look like that. Shortly after the war, it looked like this. Uh, after the Second World War, 
the Russians had moved in, used it as a headquarter, and didn't treat it too nicely then. You can see here a picture of the main area where the director's office is on the upper left and the so-called tea house on the upper right. Uh, and this was refurbished, and when I came to Yasa, it looked more like this. The tea house was reinstalled. When Howard came here, it still looked a little bit more like that and like this. Uh, but now it's absolutely beautiful, and even in Howard's day, days in 1972 to 1975, it was refurbished very nicely. One of the most beautiful rooms in the Yasa Castle is the Elizabeth Room. It's the director's ceremonial office, and I want to come back to that in a minute. It's the place where uh, Howard received his uh, ceremonial guests, uh, delegations from all over the world. And you can see this is a beautiful, historically restored rooms. Here are some pictures of Howard at Yasa. During his time on the upper right, he's actually sitting in the Elizabeth room. You can, I can tell from the, from the fabric of the wall. And you can see him here in the middle, which is a picture that so typically characterizes his style, uh, humility and friendship with his wife, Estelle, walking through the hallways of Yasa. Now, I mentioned that the castle was very beautiful with several beautifully historical rooms, but Howard chose a room that was very modest, and I think that's a great reflection on his humility. You see him here during his days at Yasa in the upper left, uh, and I took, put, took some other pictures when I became director of Yasa in 2009 to 2012. Uh, the room hasn't changed very much. It's a very functional room. It's a very modest room. And when one visitor came to me, he said, look, you have such beautiful rooms here. I think you're trying to make a statement that you want to be one of the scientists. And I thought about it, and I said, no, actually, I didn't want to make a statement. It was Howard who made that statement, and I simply followed in his footsteps. Here's another picture of Howard, Estelle, and Roger Levian, the second director of YASA looking at some materials in the Yasa building. Now, you know Yasa is, was a very, is and was a very uh, remarkable institute that was able to attract, primarily through Howard's, Howard's stature and attraction, several people who eventually became Nobel Prize winners like Charles Koopmans and uh, Tom Schelling are here some with others. And in more recent years, um, Yasa was the co-winner of the, or several scientists at YASA were co-winners of the Nobel Peace Prize for their climate change work. So this is the early days. And sometime uh, during 2008, I got a call from YASA and they asked me if I was willing to come back. I was a research scholar there during Howard's days. And they asked me if I wanted to come back. And I said, yeah, as what? And they said, as director. So my first inclination, of course, was to go to see Howard and ask him what the idea was and whether he thought this was a good thing for me to do. And you see also here on this picture, which was taken in Arizona in their home there with uh, Ralph Keeney, who we, did, he, who we consulted at the time. So I accepted, and in 2009, I came, ended up at Yasa. And here are some of the things I found which reflected so well on Howard. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, since Howard had left in 1975, uh, Yasa had dedicated a beautiful room, the Rafa room, to him. And here is what it looks like from the outside, and here is what it looks like from the inside. It's a smaller conference room, but one of the more beautiful ones, also historically decorated. Now, what is Yasa today? Today, Yasa is a global think tank which is independent and interdisciplinary. It focuses on major global problems, no longer the east-west axis that was considered as major topics before, but many countries are there now that are from the north and the south, and the idea is to find solutions to global problems through systems analysis. See here a list of uh, a number of YASA members. We now have 23 or 24. The blue ones are the only ones that are still there from the early days, uh, from the days of the 12th. Then there came several European countries. And then the expansion to China, India, Pakistan, all the way Mexico, Brazil, Vietnam, and most recently Australia, Indonesia. The United Kingdom came back, which left Yasa for a while. Iran, 
joined just very recently, a half a year ago, and negotiations are going strong with having Israel enter as well. I'm inserting this little picture here because it bridges history. The history of Yasa was Cold War bridging Soviet Union and the United States, and Kosygin on one hand, and then his representative at Yasa, German Grisiani on the other, were instrumental in that role, as was Howard Rafer and the members of the National Academy. This person down here is actually Alexei Grisiani, the grandson of Kosygin, who is now a council member of Yasa. He's been a council member when I was there, and he is there. Just to reflect where Yasa is right now, in 2011, Ban Ki-moon visited us, and we actually were quite active in writing policy papers and giving presentations to the United Nations during that process. Coming close to the end now, in 2012, there was a reunion of the YASA directors during the YASA conference uh, that commemorated the, uh, commemorated the 40 years of YASA. And you can see all of the surviving directors here with Howard in the middle in front of um, Maria Teresa in the Elizabeth room. To the left of Howard is Pavel Kabat, who is the current director. A couple of mementos. There are two things that are very dear and very kind of YASA staff and the councils to do. Whenever a director leaves, he gets a beautiful picture hung on the wall. It's not all that clear to see. The upper left is Howard. Below him is uh, Roger Levian. To the right is Buzz Hollings, and below him, um, Tom Lee. So that is a beautiful tradition. My picture is somewhere hanging to the right, and it's gotten smaller as, we, as Yasa got older because we were, we were running out of space, I guess. The other beautiful, beautiful tradition is that each director gets a tree. And so I took a picture when I was there just below the, the tea, tea house of I Elizabeth. Uh, that is Howard's tree. Uh, I forgot what kind of tree it is, um, but it's a humble tree. It, when, it, when I was there in 2012, it was maybe three or four meters high, not like one of those big oak trees. And you see the inscription on the right uh, we put all of the uh, names of the directors to each of the trees that were planted for them. And at the very bottom, to end this short presentation, you see Howard's legacy from Harvard teacher to very recently on the right, a video that Ralph and I, Ralph Keeney and I made uh, to have him give a presentation, an introduction to the YASA Systems Analysis Conference in 2015. And in the middle is Howard, late in his life, with the love of his life, Estelle.